those who have joined us tonight. Um, my name is, well, Daisy has said a lot of that anyway. Um, and I'm gonna read from this new book of poems called The Actual is Black and Gold is Glimmering Like That. And, um, and it's a poem of, um, it's a book, sorry, it's a book of, um, what, what is it about? Um, it's a litany of grievances, I think. And it started off when um, the American president said something which angered me a little bit. And I wrote a poem called um, Fuck, Fuck Trump. And then I thought it was a little bit, you know, nail in the head. So I called it Fuck 45. And then a friend um, encouraged me to write 45 similar poems. And I wrote 55 of them. And the longest poem is seven parts long in a book. So it's a sequence of poems that are intensely personal, intensely political. Um, it reads as polemic. And, um, and they cover various things um, that affect um, myself and the politics, political spaces that I find myself in here in the UK. Um, but it starts from the very um, creation of Nigeria. Um, and I'm going to read a few poems that follow that lineage um, from the conception of the country um, of which I was born, of which, of, of, which um, um, of my heritage, and then brings us right up to the moment. Um, now, the Portuguese were the first Europeans to reach Nigeria in the 16th century, and they came largely to trade, but also they established the transatlantic slave trade in southwest regions of, my, of, of the country, an area largely populated by the Igbos, one of the major tribes. So please remember the Igbos, because they're going to come back later. The north, where my ancestors were formed, were closer to the Arab world, which was ruled mostly by these nomadic tribes that fought and settled and intermarried each other, the Hausas and the Fulanis. And my paternal ancestors come from these places, come from these people, sorry. When the slave trade was finally abolished, the European um, powers still needed to make money from these regions. Um, after the Berlin Conference in 1884, the British government took over the Royal Niger Company, which was what had been established in that place to trade. And, um, and, under, and through the guise of this country, they colonized both sides of the country, killing and pillaging until the people were subdued and formed into a single country, a single factory, a country-sized factory, Nigeria, which was established in 1914, which coincidentally is when this building that I'm in right now um, was completed in 1914. Now, the Nigerians rebelled and eventually gained independence in 1960, but um, there was havoc after that. Democracy, which has arguably failed here in the UK, was imposed in Nigeria after centuries of having something more, um, 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 more organic in place. And it was imposed along tribal and geopolitical lines, which meant that the northerners, the Hausas, would always be in charge of the entire country. This was largely to serve capitalist interests. The Royal Niger Company still operates in Nigeria um, and is now called Unilever. And the Brits would then pull the strings from down in street and, the rule, and, the, and, and through this, they were able to rule the Hausas. Now the other Nigerians were really displeased with this and they rebelled and this eventually led to the civil war um, and the Igbos um, were the bots, um, were the, were suffered the most under this. This led to, this led to the, the Igbos wishing to separate from Nigeria. They declared the Republic of Biafra and this left millions internally displaced in the country. And a lot of this I dramatized in the play Daisy mentioned, um, Three Sisters, um, but this poem covers the journey of millions of Igbos from the northern from northern Nigeria fleeing the houses on foot and getting towards the southern region. And this is the first poem from the actual, and this poem is called Fuck Nigeria. You are Nigerian until they massacre your elders, until the breeze blows thick with blood. You are defiant until they erase your home, burn your harvests, shred your clothes until the locals forget you built the road you walked in on. You disbelieve until they separate your husband from his head, your wife from her eyes, your brother from his belly, until your sister's drool thickens the dust and no limb stares when your child is called. You are an infidel until your parents ask you to leave, to pack a handkerchief with food and run. You are a refugee until the river spits you out, until the miles of woods and wilds of pasture stop clawing at your raw skin. You are brave until bullets and mosquitoes bite the night the same way, until bombs fall frequent as fruit, until any whistling empties your bladder. 
You are a wreck until the guns dance to silence, until you, your people fold, officially surrender. You are relieved until night sweats, trembling, the swollen bellies of skeletal children begin haunting your every dream. For the scorched skin stretch the cross skulls and the illuming eyes in your quiet hours. You are Biafran until you die, until the struggle breaks your back. Um, and the fallout of, um, of the Civil War was the genesis of Boko Haram. Now, the Civil War, as I said, was along um, tribal and political lines, but also religious lines. The Igbos from the southern regions were largely Christians, Catholics, and the Muslims and the Hausas and the Fulanis were, were largely Muslims. And um, because of how power was mediated through the country, those in the southern regions who had given themselves or who were better colonized um, were educated by the British, which meant that um, they had, um, they, they felt, um, what's the word here? They felt um, they were naturally rebellious to House Saru, who they felt weren't educated as well, um, as well as they were. And the divisions ran, ran really deep into the country. And into this, I was born in 1984. My father was a Muslim from the north and my mother was a Christian from the middle and southern region. And um, my father, my parents respected each other's faiths, um, but my father traveled to Mecca for the pilgrimage. And when he was there, he saw some things he wasn't too pleased with and returned to Nigeria, questioning his faith. And that created chaos, which meant that um, our lives were unsafe. We fled from the north to the southern regions, but some of the violence followed us until we left Nigeria in 1996 and came here. Now in that period, um, some of the Muslims in the north were displeased, like I said, with the governance structure of the entire country. They felt like the British were tooling control. There was too much um, corruption running through the entire country. And they were largely hippies. Um, a huge contingent of them were camped around a watering hole in the north, which the Nigerian government wanted to get their hands on. And these Muslim hippies sort of did humanitarian work. They'd look after um, um, refugees streaming from the northern of the country, from, Sh from Chad and Niger, who streamed into Nigeria, fleeing persecution. And they sort of did all of this work, but the Nigerian government really wanted the area in which they were camped around. Um, and the, the government eventually drove them out, um, out of the country, um, attacked a huge number of their, of their, of their ruling elite. And um, when they left, um, they, got, they, they traveled up further up the continent towards Niger. They got weapons, they aligned themselves with, um, with ISIS and came back to Nigeria angry. And um, that's when the militant force Boko Haram came into existence. And what they did was they looked for men like them, young men like them, who were either uneducated, who were disenfranchised, who felt ignored by the government and who had no um, opportunities to work in the country. And they promised them food, shelter and purpose in life. And this poem um, called Book, um, Fuck Boko Haram really looks at the cycle of violence and what attracted these young men into these ranks and how it still plays out across the Nigerian um, country right now. Um, Boko Haram was famously known for kidnapping 264 girls from Chibok and a lot of them are still missing to this day. Um, so this is the poem. After the guns had danced to silence, the boys whose father was killed the boy whose father was killed joined the others sipping cough syrup in the tight corners of the parched village, their eyes hollow and hungry for things their widowed mothers could not provide. There were never enough schools to teach the possible rift between thought and action. The boys would lash out wild as scuffling dogs in the scavenging heat, which the men who killed their fathers took for killer instinct and came back masked in the Koran's floral lilt, promising their empty bellies fulfillment, their empty hands purpose, their empty lives love. The boys followed their lolling tongues into the desert, days and nights tottering past rattlesnakes and scorpions as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had done, seeking his destiny in caves, where more stories of him were flattened like curved knives and slipped like drips of concrete into the breaking parts of the broken boys. And bit by bone by brick, 
They were built into the militia of black flags and fire who return to the village now, guns dancing, who speak into the silence over the fresh corpses to the newly hungry and hollowed eyed boys, promising fulfillment, purpose, love, their mouths like gardens blooming in the desert's bleak. And um, the last poem I'll read um, really looks at the space there is for redemption in Northern Nigeria for these boys, these hardened um, um, young men who were radicalized. Um, and a lot of that work is happening through literature in, in the Northern region, Hausa literature specifically, so not written in English or in Arabic, but in a dialect and language that is local and specific to the country. And, um, and a lot of this work is produced by women in the North who are reclaiming um, not just the matriarchal lineages which they stand from, which was colonized by Islam um, and by um, West, Western um, culture, but also um, their own stories, creating space in this discourse, not just to offer redemption to these young men, but to themselves, for young women who, um, who they are raising their own daughters. Um, some of them is, um, some of, these, these are three of, of, I think, the most groundbreaking um, Hausa writers, novelists from the north, um, Rahma Abdul Majid, um, Balarba Ramat, and Amina Abdul Malik. And these women writers who were raised in a patriarchal society that encouraged self censorship and declared that their writings should preach goodness to avoid badness, an idea from the Quran where the Muslim is urged, urged to observe and promote what is proper and to prevent what is improper. And they found themselves navigating Islam and house or custom, trying to find the nugget of truth of space. And this poem is written in that light to bring imagination and a space for rebirth back to the land, back to the north um, where these boys are. Um, it's called Fuck Deserts and is written in response to a poem by a friend of mine called Kayo Chingonyi, who's an incredible poet. And, um, and this is my last poem for the evening, Fuck Deserts. Take the path that begins among the neem trees, as far as the stream bled of all water. Sift through its dried bed of discarded boots, you will find a rust covered compass, buff against your sleeve, when it winks with sunlight, go whichever way its needle points north. Turn right when the farmland thins to a grassy sheen. You will come to a village with none of its youth. Place your palm on the closest hot, hot husk until you sense the wind quickening tremble the walls. Punch through, push down into the hole and grab the topmost sash of vulture feathers. Hold one between your teeth until your tongue numbs, bite down. When you regain consciousness, the huts will be the sand dunes around you. The desert will hold you in its golden nothing. Lift the camel skull by your inner left thigh. Look through where once lived its left eye. You will find, stretched from horizon to the petrified sky, the answer to whom you were meant to be how you have bested that self and why this is still just you beginning. Thank you. <laughs>